Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning on this nice spring day. And I realize I am not as good looking as Pastor Aaron to open the services, um, but he has just started his sabbatical. If you could back this one down a little bit there on me. Um, Pastor Aaron started his sabbatical this week, and so he'll be for the next six weeks doing that. But I'll do my best to try to take Aaron's place on this and start the services out. Just a couple quick announcements uh, very quickly here, and then we'll pray and be into worship together in song. Um, just a reminder for those that are going on the Men for Missions trip to Camp Kenesataki, uh, that trip is coming up in just a couple weeks, but there is a meeting immediately after this service in the library. Uh, we're going get to get a chance to see what the projects are that we'll be working on. And so you can know what tools you're going to need and bring things with you. And so, men, if you could meet us over in the library immediately after this, that would be really helpful. Um, ladies as well, there's a, a ladies retreat coming up. And then also our softball team starts practices tomorrow. So if you got to get the, uh, the old glove out, oil it up, get it ready. Um, and on Monday nights, we'll start practices and games start here soon as well. And so if you'd like to come out, and by the way, that is not just for men. Ladies are welcome to play as well. Anyone 16 years of age or older can play on the softball team. It's just a great time for families to come out, have a great time around the field, and enjoy playing together and some fellowship. And so if you would like to do that, there is a sign-up sheet so we can send out messages to those that are going to be playing. And so if you want to sign up, that would be really helpful and look forward to that. There's other things on the, in the bulletin. If you'd like to get a, uh, one of your children dedicated, uh, that's coming up for Mother's Day. And then also the baptism um, weekend coming up. We're doing some baptisms in a few weeks. And if you would like to be baptized, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, but have never been biblically baptized, we'd love to talk with you about that as well. Let's, let's begin, though, in prayer. Would you stand with me together, and then we'll pray, and then we'll worship in song. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning to be able to gather together as a group of believers who are so thankful that we know you through Jesus Christ, that you would love us enough to send your only begotten Son for us, and that we can uh, talk with you in prayer, that we can gather together and worship you in song and in hearing your word preached today. Father, I pray that in this service time, Lord, that you would work in our hearts, that we would grow closer to you. Thank you for this time together. I do pray for Pastor Aaron as he's begun his sabbatical, that you'd give him just a restful time away and time off, and that that would be uh, just really helpful for him as he steps back into ministry then and he comes back. God, I pray that you would allow us as we come before you in, in singing to be able to put the other distractions and things that are in our minds, put those aside, and be able to just really focus on what we're here about, what this is about. It's about our walk with you and knowing you deeper. So, God, I pray that you would be glorified in this service. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. How marvelous.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, good morning. Okay, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 33. Okay, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of value than they? Which of you, by worrying, could add one cubit to his stature? So, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet, say to you even that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry about saying whether we shall eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Join me in a brief moment of prayer, please. Father, what a privilege it is to uh, approach your throne. How we can come to you and uh, just know that you're a God, know that you are a creator, know that you are a provider, know our healer, know that you have all things in your hands. Even like scripture says, the little things. How much more important are the bigger things Yet we do worry about these things. Help us, Father, to be calm in the storm, even though we know things could happen that are way out of our control. We know that you're in control and you have our lives in your hands. Father, as we study your word today, we thank you so much for Dr. Lands. We pray for your spirit to uh, just open the eyes and our hearts so that we can hear and know your word and apply it to our lives. So when we leave today, we can go to our jobs, our communities, our neighbors, our families, and things that really kind of we wrap ourselves up in and get very concerned about, and rightly so sometimes. But just help us know, Father, that this is your will. You got us right where you want us. You've given us, you've equipped us, You've given us a body of believers here, gifted people that hide your word in their hearts and are willing to serve and do things. Help us, Father, to be uh, your soldiers. It's a battleground. It's not a playground out there. But we do thank you for the body that we can come today and have just this connection and we can have camaraderie and we can have the word of God fed to us. We thank you so much for your spirit. Open our heart, eyes, Father. Open our spiritual hearts so that we can hear your message today. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. And would you stand and join us as we continue in song this morning? And as we do, we will go ahead and dismiss children for Children's Church at this time. But let's lift our voices together as we sing His mercy is more. Praise the Lord.
it's a privilege this morning to introduce a guest speaker uh, with you guys, and he has been a longtime friend of mine uh, in ministry. We actually were able to, uh, I was a one of the pastors at the church that he was a senior pastor at in West Virginia. Uh, Dr. John Lands uh, was a senior pastor of Fellowship Baptist Church in Vienna, West Virginia for 23 years, and then for the last few years has been the executive vice president down at Pensacola Christian College. And so we flew him out of the south and brought him up here, and uh, it turned cold. So sorry about that. Uh, it was nicer earlier in the week, I promise, but uh, it's good to have him and good to just reconnect. Uh, he has been a long-term, just a mentor and friend to me in ministry, and I know you're going to enjoy hearing from him. And so thank you for coming up, and would you come and share this morning? Well, good morning. If you would, please take your Bible and find the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. We'll direct our attention there in just a moment. Let me say I am honored to be here. I believe this is my third time to be here at First Baptist in Belfont. Uh, Greg mentioned that we served together in uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia. Thankful for those years. He was with us for about nine years and uh, of the 23 that I was in West Virginia. I'm thankful for those times. A uh, good friend, he and Miss Connie are sweet friends to my wife and I and our family. So how did I get here this time? Well, let me just give you the brief rundown. It was sometime last year, Greg gave me a call and said, John, do you believe in free speech? I said, absolutely, I believe in free speech. He said, good, come to Belfont and give one. So that's why I'm here this morning. <laughs> If he is tight as pine bark, he learned it from me because I'm just as uh, uh, cost effective in many ways. In all seriousness, your hospitality has been wonderful. Your mission house is, in, is impressive. Uh, whoever put the gift bag together, apparently you called to find out what my favorite things were, so thank you for that. And I appreciate everything, the opportunity to be here. And this is beautiful weather. Considering I came from hot humidity, uh, this is refreshing and probably a place that I, w I enjoy visiting more than any other place in the country when I come up to uh, Belfont, Pennsylvania. When my youngest son was about seven years old, we were in the checkout line in Walmart, and as we were waiting, he brought me a package of Skittles. Have you ever noticed how convenient they keep those candy things in front of you there? He, w he came over to me and handed me that bag of Skittles, and I said, son, you don't need that candy. I knew that it was about 4.30 in the afternoon, we'd be going home shortly, and my wife would be making supper, and I would be foolish to give my son candy right before supper time. So I decided to turn him down, and I made it a teachable moment. I looked at my son, handing the candy back to him, and I said, now son, understand, this is a want, not a need. Without missing a beat, my son Josiah looked right back at me, and he said, but dad, I need it to satisfy my want. <laughs> He will either be a preacher or a politician one day. <laughs> the truth is, God is not primarily concerned with meeting our wants, but He does promise to meet our needs. It's the most familiar verse, perhaps, on the matter of God's meeting our needs, Philippians 4, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God will meet your need. We like the promise, but often we don't care for the process. There is a process in which God meets our needs, and sometimes it's not pleasant. From the beginning of time, humanity has had needs, and God has been faithful to meet those needs throughout all of time. Recently, I'd been studying Scripture, and I, I noticed that even in the innocence of the garden, in the innocence of the Garden of Eden, Adam was a man that was in need, a singular need that was presented in the fact that he had a problem, that he was alone. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18, after God has reviewed all of creation, after God has seen all that he's made, he sees Adam wandering through the garden, and he says it's not good that man should be alone. Aren't you glad that God isn't some uncaring, distant deity who identifies the problem but doesn't offer a solution? 
Instead, God identified the problem, and as he began to identify the problem, he began the process of meeting the need of companionship for Adam. The truth is that every one of us who are in this room today, we all have needs. Adam's case, it was companionship, but for some who are here today, it may be a physical need. You received bad news from the doctor this week or in recent weeks. For others, it may be an emotional need. There's a struggle that you constantly bear as a burden in your very soul. For others, it's a spiritual need. There's something you're struggling with as if the enemy is attacking you consistently. For the next few moments, I'd like for us to consider how God meets those needs. And it's based on the example of God's work in Adam's life in the very beginning. And as we study, I want you to notice there are four principles from this biblical account of how God meets our needs. Here's the first principle, the omniscience principle. God knew Adam's need before Adam knew he had a need. Look again, Genesis 2, verse number 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. Adam was one who who had an unrealized need. He did not realize he needed a help meet, but God recognized that unrealized need. Those of you who are in business or those of you who serve in a role with marketing, you understand what's called a, a, a latent need. The formal definition of a latent need is a need that cannot be satisfied due to lack of information or availability of a product or a service. In very plain English, a latent need is a problem that a user or a consumer doesn't even realize they have. An example of a latent need that has been met would be that of the telephone. Up until 1876, no one knew there was a need for a telephone. When Alexander Graham Bell developed the telephone, immediately things began to change. Within 25 years, most of the East Coast had a home. In each home on the East Coast, there was a telephone. Fast forward almost 150 years, I dare say every single one of us in this auditorium today probably has one of these phones on us at this point. I can't live without this thing. This is the clock that keeps me to make sure that we get out of here early. You want me to keep this thing up here. Not only is it my clock, it's my calendar. Not only is it my calendar, it's the means of communication with my family. We have a text chat that we're constantly going back and forth on. This is, this is really my office anymore. Everything I do is in this phone. I cannot imagine not having this phone with me at any given moment. But amazingly, before 1876, they made it without it. It was a latent need. They didn't even understand what the phone would be and how the phone would change life. And may I say to you that the latent needs that we often have in our life are needs that we're not aware of, but God knows that we have that need in our life. And Adam was the first human with that latent need. He didn't know he needed Eve, but God did. You know, it's a New Testament principle as well. Jesus met that, uh, gave that New Testament principle in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 8, when he said this, Your Father knoweth what things you have need of, notice this, before you even ask Him. Before you even recognize you have the need, before you ever bow your head in prayer, God knew you had that need. I love Matthew chapter 6 because the very next verse In chapter 6, verse 8 is followed by verse number 9. That's a brilliant thought when you think about that sequential order. I love it because Jesus gives us the model prayer where he says, After this manner pray ye therefore, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That same son who got the Skittles, I remember one time he was studying his scripture verses for Awana so that he could recite them and receive the, the necessary prizes and awards. And as he was reciting it to me, he recited it incorrectly. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, I know you know my name. I like that because it even, even though it is a misquote, it is accurate theology. That God knows our name. Can I have an amen right there? But not only does he know your name, he knows your need. He knows your need before you even recognize you have a need. Well, that's the first principle. You're counting down. You're thinking he's probably got three or four, so we'll be out of here very shortly. And all of God's people say, hallelujah, amen. (laughs) The omniscience principle. God knew Adam's need before Adam knew he had a need. Here's the second principle. 
the preparation principle. God cultivated the need in Adam's heart before he met it. You're in Genesis 2. Look again at verse number 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names unto all the cattle, unto the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. If you circle in your Bible in verse number 19, circle that word brought. It, it gives the idea of a parade. God brought all of the animals in front of Adam, paraded them before him, and the purpose of that was to see what Adam would name those animals. Now, was God in, incapable of naming the animals? I remind you that the Bible says in Psalm 147, verse 4, that God knows the number of the stars and He calls them by name. When God flung the stars out against the velvet darkness of space, He then made a count of all of those stars from Orion to all of the various constellations around the universe, and then He began to call each of those stars by name. It was not for lack of capability that God did not name the animals. It was an assignment that he had given to Adam for the purpose of preparing him to meet his need. God was showing Adam that there are two genders in each animal of creation. There is male and there is female. Notice what it says in this, this text. Verse number 20 says, and, and Adam gave names to all the cattle, plural, the fowl of the air in the Hebrew, it's plural, to every beast of the field, it's in the plural. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. God never does anything by accident, and God never lets anything be wasted. He purposefully said, Adam, I'm bringing all of the animals of creation before you, and as you see these animals, there's going to be something that you know that they have a help me, they have a companion, but you don't. Adam noticed there was a Mr. Cat for Mrs. Cat, a Mr. Giraffe and Mrs. Giraffe. There was a Mrs. Hippopotamus for a Mr. Hippopotamus. No female wants to be called Hippopotamus, but that's neither here nor there. God was cultivating the need in Adam's heart. How did God cultivate that need? It's a four-letter dirty word in our culture today. W-O-R-K. It really begins in Genesis 2, verse number 15, where the Bible says that he placed Adam in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The word dress gives the idea of working and laboring. The word keep gives the idea of watching over. And in the process of dressing and keeping, God said to Adam, your assignment is to name all of these animals. Do you realize that what you are doing right now, that job that you think is dead end for your career, that place that you serve that feels listless and mundane. What, what you are doing right now, God is preparing you for the next step. He, he's bringing this into your life as part of your preparation. For some of you, it's a relationship. Some of you are getting, trying to get along with someone that's just unbearable to get along with. Does anybody can say amen to that? I can raise my hand. There are just some people that it requires the grace of God, and it's amazing that that grace even sometimes is sufficient. But in doing so, God is preparing you for the next step because you're working to live peaceably with all men. For some of you, you're working through emotions right now. It's the, the emotion of a broken heart. Maybe it's the emotion of an unmet expectation. But I promise you, nothing is wasted in God's economy. He's using this to prepare for you, prepare you for something far better. There are experiences in life that sometimes we don't recognize what God is doing, but when we come to the end of the, of the, of the situation, we begin to recognize that He's just preparing us for the next opportunity. I, I've seen it in my life. I've experienced. I can testify. And I promise you that God, as, as, you, as you go through this moment, God is using this to prepare you for the very next step. The first principle, the omniscience principle, God knew Adam's need before Adam knew he had a need. The preparation principle, God cultivated the need in Adam's heart before he met it. Here's the third principle, the rest principle. For Adam to have his need met, he had to rest in God's power. 
Look at the text this morning, verse number 21, Genesis 2, verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. But notice the Bible says deep sleep. It's, it has the idea of, uh, of, uh, of, of anesthesia. You know there's different levels of anesthesia. You can do twilight, you can do deep sleep. Some of you look like you're in the third stage of anesthesia right now. Uh, we will be finished here soon, I promise you. You say, Dr. Lance, do you believe that this is a literal sleep? I believe it's a literal sleep. Do you believe that this is a literal creation? If creation was allegorical, then the cross is useless. The Bible makes it clear that God created, and as a result of, of man's fall, it was need for, a need for salvation. If we believe that this is not literal, then there's no need for us to believe the rest of the Bible. So it's a literal sleep, but in the context of applying a principle, God doesn't place us under anesthesia. But it is figurative of a rest that we can have in him. We apply it to our lives and we recognize that Adam could not find the solution to his need until he rested in the Lord to provide it. And the same is true for us. When we're resting in the Lord, God can accomplish more in our ease than we ever could in our effort. I've learned that as a pastor. I've learned that now serving where I'm serving as a as the executive vice president, it is not anything I can do. It is all God who does it through me. And for so long, I spent my life trying and, and grabbing and, and wanting to, to, to move forward and, and, and move up and, and move out and do all of these things. But I've come to the real conclusion that it's just better to rest in the Lord and let His power do the work. And it's far more amazing. Jesus understood that when he was speaking to those folks that were there gathered as he was preaching. He looked at them and he said, Come unto me, all ye that are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you, say it with me. Then he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. When you read that, you can't read it out of the context. He's speaking to those folks that are weighed down, worn out from the burden of the Pharisees. There were those that said the only way you can relate to God is by doing this and doing this and not doing this and not doing this, the legalism of that day. And Jesus says to them, those of you that are worn out with religion, those of you that are worn out with all of man-made uh, requirements, Come to me. Those of you that have labored, that are just worn out, those of you that are heavy laden, you're, you're weighed down, come and I will give you rest. But then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest for your soul. When you read that text, you're going to notice in verse 28, he's speaking of the matter of salvation. You cannot do anything to earn your salvation. You rest in him and the work that he has done. You may think, well, I hope I get into heaven. My good works outweigh my bad works. I, I hope because I come to First Baptist Belfond and I serve in various areas of this ministry that I get into heaven. Let me tell you, you do not go to heaven based on your works. You go to heaven by the work of Jesus Christ. And that work is something that you rest in. He gives you that rest. It's the rest of salvation in verse 28, but it's the rest of surrender in verse 29. After you've been saved, you surrender yourself to Him and you take His yoke upon you and you begin to learn of Him and you get that meek spirit, that lowly heart. And the Bible says then you find rest for your souls. And that is the rest that we find here in this principle. When we yield ourselves to God, stopping all of the efforts of our own, resting in Him, letting, letting the Lord do the work, it is then that we see He meets our need. Why is it we can't find rest for our souls sometimes? I believe the psalmist answered that for us in Psalm 37, verse number 5 through 7. He said this, Commit thy way unto the Lord, and trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall 
He shall uh, commit your, uh, tr- uh, he, he shall meet your needs as you commit your way. That, that word commit has the idea, I'm, I'm thinking two things at once. I'm, I'm not a parallel track type personality. I want to say this, the, that word commit gives the idea of rolling away. Commit your way unto the Lord. Give it to him. Stop holding on to it. Surrender it to him. Transfer it to him. And when you do, you can rest in him and the work that he is doing. You see, it's the equivalent of saying, not my will, Lord, but yours. It's the equivalent of saying, Lord, I can't do it. Only you can. I don't know what you're dealing with today. I don't know what insurmountable need that you have that God's been preparing you for and God knew you had this need before you even had the need. I don't know what you're trying to do to try to meet that need, but take the example of Adam and just relinquish it to God. And rest in Him. It's the omniscience principle. God knew Adam's need before Adam knew he had a need. The preparation principle. God cultivated the need in Adam's heart before he met it. The the rest principle. For Adam to have his need met, he had to rest in God's power. Here's the fourth principle. The extraction principle. God took something away from Adam... To give Adam what he needed. This is the hard part of the message. Because it's clear that God sometimes gives and other times he takes away. You're in the text. Look at verse number 21. Genesis 2, 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took, circle that word took if you would please, he took one of his ribs and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, circle that word taken, the the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. We're told twice that, that God had taken from Adam, from his very skeletal frame. He, he, he took that rib. He, he reached inside of Adam and removed a rib. And from that extraction, he, he, he made the woman, the need was met through the extraction of Adam's life. And the principle is this, that God took the lesser to meet the greater need for Adam. And the greater need was a help need. I dare say if you were to ask Adam before the divine surgery, Adam, Do you need that rib? Well, of course I need that rib. That rib is part of my skeletal frame. It's what helps me. It's what helps me stand upright. If he was like I am from East Tennessee, he says that's what holds my innards in. That that keeps my, my my guts in place. I need that rib. That rib is so important. But can you imagine after Adam awakened from the divine surgery, and he saw Eve? And he said, whoa, man. If we were to ask Adam, Adam, would you rather have your rib back or would you rather have Eve? Adam would say, I would much rather have Eve. Because she meets a need that I didn't even know that I had. And I recognize that God has been preparing me so that that need could be met. And when I rested in him, he did a divine work in my life and met that need. There are some of you this morning that are on the altar. There are some of you that are on the surgery table of God. And he is reaching into your very soul. And he's taking something from you that is so valuable, so important to you. You're holding on with all of your your being. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's some possession that you have. Maybe it's some uh, thought that you have in your mind. Maybe it's some hope or some expectation. And God is taking that from you. And you say, that is so important, God. Don't take that from me. But if you'll just rest in him and let let God do his work, he will give to you the need that you don't even recognize you have. And you will say, his way is perfect. A few years ago, I was reading a, a periodical entitled Creation Magazine. Some of you may read it. 
There was an article in there written by Dr. Carl Weiland. He's a family practice physician, and he, he wrote a piece, really a testimonial of an, a, an accident that he had a number of years before. He was in a head-on collision with a tractor trailer. He survived uh, uh, that, uh, that accident, but he had a number of surgeries to follow up. What he wrote was so appropriate for this moment as we study this text. Forgive my extended reading, but listen to what he wrote. Dr. Weiland said, A head-on impact with a fully laden fuel tanker at highway speeds is an experience I would hope for none to share. The surprise was to have to survive it, for God clearly had other plans for me. During the five and a half months in, hosp in the hospital and for years afterwards, I had a series of operations to reconstruct various parts of me, particularly the bones of my face. These operations were often required using my own bone for, for grafting. I noticed that the plastic surgeon would keep going back to the right side of my rib cage through the same horizontal scar actually to get more bone for these procedures. One day I asked him why he hadn't run out of bone. He looked at me blankly and then explained that he and his team had taken a whole rib out each time. He said, we, we leave the periosteum intact so that the rib usually will grow right back again. Dr. Weiland wrote, despite having been trained in practice as a family doctor, I was intrigued. I'd really never realized this before. The periosteum, which is Latin, which literally means the, the membrane around the bone. The periosteum is that membrane that covers the bone. And the periosteum contains the cells that can manufacture new bone. Particularly in young people, rib periosteum has the remarkable ability to regenerate bone, perhaps more so than any other. Dr. Weiland continues, when the surgeon initially told me this, my immediate thought was, wow, that's really neat. Adam didn't have to walk around with a defect. Surprisingly, some Christians have grown up believing that men have one less rib than women. But they have the same number, of course. He then concludes and says, however, this information about rib regrowth adds a new and fascinating dimension. The God who designed the rib along with the periosteum would have certainly known how to remove the rib in such a way that he could give Eve to Adam and even allow the rib to grow back again later, just as ribs do today. Isn't God an amazing God? Isn't God a gracious God that not only... Not only does he give us what we need, and in the extraction process, he sometimes takes that which is lesser to give us the greater, but in his grace, he returns to us often what we had to give up. I think of the story of Job. Job was that man who understood the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. The Bible says that he was a man of great fortune. He was a man of great fame. He was a, a man a, a, of great faith. He was a man that was known for who he was in the Lord, and God had blessed him. But one day, as he was going about his business, he pulled out his, his calendar, and he began to note the business deals that he was going to go about. And as he went through his day, news began to come of all the things that were immediately removed from his asset list. 7,000 sheep were lost in an instant. 3,000 camels were stolen by, uh, by the Sabaeans, and 500 yoke of oxen were lost, and 500 donkeys, immediately they were taken from him. And the greatest loss was when he received the report that a whirlwind had come to where his children were gathering. All 10 of those children were immediately lost in that moment. And at that time, with that great sorrow in his heart, the Bible says that he sat down in sackcloth and ashes, and he said, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Bible goes on to say that his friends came to visit him. They weren't very good friends at times. Some said it's because you've made God mad that he's done this. Some said it's because there's sin in your life. Some said it's because you're a hypocrite. They all come with all of their conclusions. And finally, when you come to the end of the book of Job and Job 42, the Bible says that God didn't turn the captivity of Job until he prayed for those sorry friends that he had. 
And when he did, the Bible says that he blessed, God blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. How did that happen? When you looked at his asset list prior to the time uh, of that, tar- that terrible day, he had 7,000 sheep and lost them. But in the latter end, the Bible says the Lord gave him 14,000 sheep. When you look at his asset list before that terrible day, he had 3,000 camels. But now, at, in the latter end, God gave him 6,000 camels. In the, in, in, in the beginning, he had 500 yoke of oxen. God gave him 1,000 yoke of oxen. He had 500 donkeys at the beginning. God gave him 1,000 donkeys. God blessed his latter end more than his beginning. And the Bible says in chapter 42, verse number 33, that he also had seven sons and three daughters. He had ten children. You say, God didn't bless him with 20 children? Well, number one, Miss Job couldn't have handled that if she did. But he did bless him with 20 children. Ten were in heaven and ten were here on earth. Because the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And he gives us just what we need through that process. I don't know about you. But maybe you're here this morning and there is something in your life that you are recognizing God is, is, is developing the need in your life. You're recognizing that God is working in your life and you're trying everything you can. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel called to ministry and you're doing everything to get into ministry. Let me give you a word of warning. Let God do the work. You can't do it. Maybe you're here this morning and your marriage is on the rocks and you're doing everything you can to bring that marriage back together. And thank you for that desire. Thank you for that that wonderful goal in your life. But let me let you in on a secret. Only God can heal a broken marriage. Maybe you're here this morning and there's some other need in your life and you're doing all you can. Just give it to God and say, God, you know the need that I don't even know that I have at this point. And God, you're preparing me in this moment as I work through these things, as I I deal with these struggles. And Lord, I'm just going to rest in you. I can't do it. Only you can. And God, I lay myself before you. Whatever you need to take out of my life, take it. It is yours. You are the king of my life, the Lord of my life. I give it to you. You do what you need to do in my heart, in my life. Take my houses, take my lands. Change my dreams, change my plans. For I'm placing my whole life in your hands. You see, God can do something through you when you yield yourself completely to Him and say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you with the needs in my life. Because, Lord, you made a promise. You promise that you'll meet my need. But God, I also trust you in the process. I trust you that your way is best. That's how God meets our needs. Father, I thank you this morning that your word is so ever clear and the thoughts are ever so simple that you're a gracious God Often, Lord, we don't understand what you're doing. Many times your ways are above our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But as you work, may we rest in you. There may be someone who is here this morning who is struggling with something, holding on tightly, thinking they have full control. I pray that you'll help them to understand the divine work that you're doing. I pray that you'll help them to rest in your power to do the work. And may they yield themselves completely to you. Lord, thank you that we can say with Job, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you that you are a good and gracious God. I pray as well, Lord, for that one who may be here today who's trying to earn their way into heaven to try to have a relationship with you. May they recognize they cannot, by their own merit, by their own work, come into that relationship. It's by the work that Jesus has already done on the cross. 
is the completed work of salvation. And Lord, may they fully rest. May they come giving up the labor and the heavy burdens that they carry trying to bring themselves into relationship. May they come to you and may you give them that rest that you so graciously promise. I pray that you'll speak to that one that may be here today to settle that matter. That the message this morning is for those of us who are believers that we'll come to him and that we'll take his yoke upon us We'll learn with a spirit of meekness, a spirit of humility, and we find that rest. Lord, it's liberating. I can testify to that. When it's not about me, it's all about you. When we can just find the rest that you give us. I pray today there'll, others, there'll be others who join the ranks of those who found that gracious rest that you give. In Christ's name. Amen. Aren't you thankful we have a good Heavenly Father? That His purposes and plans for us are not for evil, but are for good. Even when we don't understand it, we don't mean always understand what He's doing or why He's doing it. I'm sure Adam didn't understand why are you doing this, God? Why why don't I have this? Why are you taking this? And yet God had a good plan. And so just a good thought for you to remember, keep trusting him. He's working for our good. That's so important for us to keep in mind. We're looking forward to this evening as well, having Dr. Land share uh, again the evening service. And so I trust you'll be here for that, uh, to be encouraged and challenged. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he is, uh, on, he is the executive vice president at PCC. If you have some questions about Pensacola you'd like to ask, he, I'm sure he'd be willing to answer those. Um, however, normally if you see him at college, like if you have to go to his office, that's a bad day. Um, so that's, he's not really here as a rep, but he would be happy to answer any questions you have on that as well. Um, he's here as a friend to come and share God's word with us, and we appreciate that. And um, so good to have him here. We're going to stand and sing a closing song together, and then don't forget, uh, guys that are part of the uh, Men for Missions trip, where we meet in the library immediately after this to go over the plans for that and the projects we'll be doing. And so if you'd meet over there, that'd be great. Let's stand together as we sing, Oh Great God. Oh Great God of highest heaven, occupy my Lord.
melhores mesmo.